Amen. Let me invite you to take your, your uh, not your hymn books, <laughs> take your Bibles and, uh, and go to the Gospel of Luke this morning as we continue to study through Luke. And as we come to, to the Gospel of Luke, we're reminded that Jesus has called his 12, 12 disciples to be his apostles. And so these 12 apostles were divinely appointed uh, as ambassadors who would go out and preach the gospel to the world. So after Jesus chose this, these 12, he teaches what it means to follow him. And he pronounces four blessings uh, that we talked about. He talked about the, the blessings and the woes. Jesus pointed out that his followers, his disciples, that they would endure poverty, hunger, sorrow, and persecution. But in their suffering, they would come to understand and to recognize his blessing. And so there's really two kinds of people, according to what Jesus taught in Luke 6. People who would suffer for his sake and have his blessing, and people who would live for themselves and would not be happy at all, and they would come to a very unhappy end. So when we're serving the Lord, we come to recognize as Christians that people might not like us. In fact, people will even hate us at times. People will ex exclude us, insult us, and will reject us. That's what it says in Luke 6, 22. But now he goes a step further in our text this morning, and he tells us that we're to actually love our persecutors. But how, how do we do that? Well, Jesus gives us very clear instructions in the text that we're gonna study this morning. And let me just tell you, um, as we begin, this is a, a rich text. There's a lot in here. And, uh, and let me encourage you, uh, don't be watching your watch because <laughs> this might go a little later than normal. So just a heads up on that. But Luke, <laughs> Luke chapter 6, um, we're going to read starting in verse 27 through verse 36. So there it says in Luke 6, 27, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs you, who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, so do to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time this morning. Lord, we are so thankful for giving us your word. We're so thankful for this text of scripture that we can study this morning and come to understand how we can love the way that we're, we, we're supposed to. Help us, Lord, to learn how to love even our enemies. And so, Lord, I pray that you just have your hand on us. Help us to be submissive to your Spirit's work. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we have the heart, really, of the, the New Testament ethic that's taught to us by Jesus Christ. And he's speaking these commands with divine authority. And really, the overarching theme in, in this passage is to love your enemies. And he says it three times. He says it in verse 27, verse 32, and then again in verse 35. But we really need to understand what love is. What does love look like? Well, the Greek word here is agapeo, which is unconditional love. It means that we're to show love no matter what, even if people may remain enemies for our entire life. You know, it's natural for us to love our family, to love our kids. That's a natural thing. But to love enemies, that's truly a, only a divine thing. It's only something that God can do in us. And so this is a command of, of radical, aggressive action. We have to do something, and that's what this love is referring to. It's not a, a passive action where we just sit there and just expect it to happen. Jesus is not just telling us to, uh, to stop doing things, you know, stop being rude, stop being selfish, and so on, but actually to do something. Jesus wants us to be kind to the unkind. He wants us to be loving to the unloving. 
And here he tells us to love our enemies. And what kinds of enemies? Well, we could be talking about enemies of the church, people who are seeking to persecute us as, as a church, as Christians, as, as a whole. But it's also enemies of us personally. You know, there are people out there who want us to look stupid, not succeed, and they may even wish that, that we will get sick, that we would get ill. There are people that may even try to add to our, our difficulty or add to our grief. And David recognized this. In Psalm 35, he wrote, and he said, my, my, in my adversity, they do rejoice. So what does this radical love look like? Well, the love that Jesus commands is a love that will return blessing for cursing. You know, in our, in our human nature, we want to defend ourselves. We want to push for justice. But we must not ex- excuse ourselves or rationalize our actions, but instead show consistent love. So this blessed life that Jesus was talking about leading up to this text is a life that involves persecution. We don't passively take it. Instead, he goes further and says that we're actually to love those, love these people who reject us, who revile us. He doesn't just say to to stop lying, for instance, but he says to build up one another. Christianity is not a list of don'ts, of don't smoke, don't drink, don't, don't chew, don't watch immoral, immoral videos. And the list could go on of maybe the things that you've been, been taught or have heard that Christians ought not do. But that's not the way the Bible defines godliness. Yes, we're to put off sin, but more importantly, we, we are to be pursuing righteousness. We're to be evidencing the fruit of the Spirit. We resist the works of the flesh in order to grow to be more like Christ. Jesus says, you will be persecuted, so rejoice in it. And we might wonder, well, what's harder than that? That's very difficult to rejoice when we're persecuted. Well, what's harder than that, I think, is what Jesus now is calling us to do, where he tells us to actually do good to the one that is persecuting us. It doesn't seem reasonable, does it? And the answer is no, because it is a supernatural thing that has to happen through the Holy Spirit's work in us. It goes against our nature as people, and even more so as, I think, Americans, because we simply want justice. We want to see justice done. However, sometimes we must endure wrong by not retaliating. And we're to actually do so with an attitude that is loving. I think none of us have problems loving the the friends and family members that we get along with. And the world says, rightly, to to love your friends, be loyal to your friends, look out for your friends. But the question is why? And the the answer is because they'll look out for you because of your own self-interest. Loving your friends is just smart. Loving your friends is enlightened self-interest. But it's altogether another thing to love an enemy, someone who has your dishonor or your destruction as their goal. So who are your enemies? Well, I'm not just talking about who you may dislike or who you might even hate, but actually your enemies that I think this is referring to is the people that dislike you, the people that hate you, the people that are out to get you. These are the people that have bitterness and hatred in their hearts against us, people that don't seek our good, only what is evil. It's these people that Jesus is calling us to love. Loving our enemies goes contrary it goes contrary to what feels right or normal. Loving our enemies is a very challenging thing. So does this, does this mean that we're to do good to a criminal when he tries to rob or murder us? Does this mean that we're to, to aid those who are seeking to, to destroy our family? And no, I don't believe it does at all. Because I think scripture does not require us to p- perform acts of kindness to an enemy which will help that enemy to do more harm to us or a loved one. I think we need to make sure that we understand that. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's not requiring us to perform acts of kindness to an enemy, which will help that enemy to do more harm to us or to others. There was a a Baptist pastor during the American Revolution. His name was Peter Miller. And he lived in Ephrata, Pennsylvania. One of his dearest friends at the time was uh, General George Washington. And there in, the, in his hometown of, of Ephrata, there also lived a, a, a troublemaker there in the community whose name was Michael Whitman. 
who did all he could to oppose and humiliate Miller. And so one day, uh, Whitman was arrested for treason, and he was actually sentenced to death. So when Miller heard the news, he actually set out to Philadelphia to plead for the life of his enemy. So after walking, notice that, walking 70 miles on foot, Miller petitioned his friend, General Washington, to spare Whitman's life. So General Washington said, no, Peter, I cannot grant you the life of your friend. My friend, exclaimed the pastor, he's not my friend. In fact, he is the, he is the bitterest enemy I have. What? cried Washington. You've walked 70 miles to save the life of an enemy? That puts the matter in a different light. I will grant you your pardon. And in fact, he did. And that day, Miller and Whitman walked back home to Ephrata together. When they arrived home, they were no longer enemies, but they were friends. Scripture tells us to do good to those who hate us. Now, I think we, we believe we're doing well when we don't hate those who hate us. We become unshaken and unconcerned by those who, who hate us. But loving our enemies is not just simply a lack of retaliation. Loving our enemies does not mean that I won't punch them in the face for what they did to me. Loving our enemies does not mean that, that, that we'll treat them the way that we were treated. But Jesus is calling for a positive action towards our enemy when he tells us to do good to those who hate you, to bless them. There's no excuse for not treating a person well. And so we're never excused from this, this command. There's no, yeah, but he did such and such to me. We're never justified in treating people poorly. So not only are our actions to be positive towards our enemies, but our words are also to be positive. And, and the idea of blessing is to invoke God's favor on another's behalf, or at least appeal to God for that person. It's difficult to respond with words of grace and kindness when somebody is, is cursing at us and using unkind language towards us. Usually our response is in the same fury and intensity that we're encountering. But Jesus is calling for us to have this unnatural response. So when you think of the person who is slandering you, saying untrue and nasty things about you, we're to find ways to work blessing into our thoughts to speak a, a blessing out loud. When you're with friends, instead of complaining about your unjust treatment, go out of your way actively to speak well of your enemy. So what does radical love look like? Well, the love that Jesus commands here is a love that will return blessing for cursing. And it will respond with prayer. He tells us to pray for those who abuse you. And in Matthew 5, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. You know, it's clear in, in Scripture that Jesus expects us to pray for our enemies. But how do we do that? You know, our first response to that question is probably not the right one. When someone wrongs us, we like to pray for disaster to come upon them. We may be tempted to pray imprecatory psalms and to sit back and want to watch God uh, bring out his vengeance on evil, much like Jonah did outside of, of Nineveh. But that's not what Jesus meant by praying for our enemies. He had something much better in mind that will benefit us as well as our enemies. When someone sets out to cause us harm, the natural reaction to that is to protect ourselves, to fight back. You know, they gossiped about us, I'll, I'll gossip about them. They lied about me, I'll lie about him. They smeared our reputation, we'll smear theirs as well. However, Jesus calls us to a much higher standard. He demonstrated that standard by never retaliating when someone wronged him. Jesus had his own enemies. And so when he said to pray for our enemies, he knew exactly what he was talking about. So when you're praying, you probably pray for your family. You probably pray for your church. You probably pray for your friends and um, even our, our, our nation. But why don't you begin to pray and to intercede for your enemies? 
to actively, to do that, to ask God to help them, to ask God to heal the hurts in their lives that are often some of the motivators and why they're hurting you and have become your, own, your enemy. Ask God to bless them, to show mercy to them. Why? To, to shame them? No. In order to, to find it in your heart to have the right kind of love that God requires us to have. He says to pray for those who mistreat you. We're not to mistreat those who mistreat us. Instead, we're to do good for them. We're to speak gracious, graciously of them, and we're to pray for them. Pray to God that they will change their lives and repent. Pray to God that they will become a disciple of Jesus. Pray on the behalf of those who mistreat us. Stephen stands as a powerful example in Acts 6. He was the first Christian martyr that when he was stoned to death, he fell on his knees and prayed for his killers in Acts 7. He said, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. Stephen is a powerful example, but Jesus is the perfect example. He prayed for his enemies when he was being nailed to the cross. In the middle of his own agony, he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. He talked to his father about the people who were harming him. He didn't ask for their destruction. He didn't pray for revenge. He prayed that they would be forgiven. Jesus had compassion on the deceived people who believed they were doing the right thing by killing the Son of God. They had no idea what was actually taking place. They had no idea how wrong they actually were. So when Jesus said, they don't know what they're doing, he hinted at an important factor to keep in mind when we pray for our enemies. That sometimes we don't know what's going on in their lives. We don't know what they're trying to accomplish, and they may even be deceived of what they're doing. But how do we pray for those who have hurt us? Well, I want to give you three ways that we can pray for those who have harmed us. We can pray that God will open the eyes of their hearts and that they will be enlightened about truth, as it talks about in Ephesians 1. When enemies set themselves against us, they lack understanding. They're reacting often from the flesh Instead, if they're a believer, from responding in the Spirit. So we can pray that God will open their hearts with understanding so that they will learn from their mistakes and will grow in Him. As we pray for our enemies, we should pray for their repentance. 2 Timothy 2 says that opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. So it's God who softens hearts so that they will come to repentance. When we pray for our enemies to repent, we know we're praying in accordance with God's will because we know he also desires for them to, for them to repent, as it says in 2, Timothy, or 2 Peter 3.9. Then as we pray for our enemies, we can pray that God will work in their lives because of, of, of this offense and bring about his purpose. Jesus taught us how to pray in Matthew 6, where he says, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. So I think it's always right to ask God for his will to be done in any situation. We should pray until we want what he wants. If he wants to bless our enemy, then we should want that too. If he wants us to serve our enemy in some way, then that, that's what we ought to desire. Prayer is simply the aligning of our wills with God's. And so when we pray for our enemies, we need to wrestle through our emotions until we truly want God's best for their lives. Praying for our enemies, is, it's not a natural response to mistreatment, but we remember that we were once enemies of God ourselves. But now as Christians, we're now his children. We can now intercede for others who are still far off. In doing so, we keep our own hearts free from bitterness. As we pray for our enemies, we can become more like Christ. And we keep ourselves in harmony with God's will, which is how every human being is designed to live. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote that prayer is a supreme demand. Through the medium of prayer, we go to our enemy, stand by his side, and plead for him to God. Prayer is how we go to our enemy, stand by his side, and plead for him to God. So what does this radical love look like? Well, it's the love that Jesus commands is a love that will return blessing for cursing. It's a love that will respond with prayer 
And then number three, it's a love that will refuse to get offended. In verse 29, it talks about this, this slap on the, on the cheek. If you're uh, hit in one cheek, you're supposed to turn and offer the other cheek. And really, this idea here, it's, it's idiomatic for an insult. This is, we're not talking about a, a fist fight, but simply insults. Jesus is saying that if somebody insults you by giving you the, the back of, of their hand, you're to turn the other cheek, to let him insult you repeatedly, and do not return insult for insult. In verse 31, we have what is commonly referred to as, as the golden rule, where it says to, as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. He's telling us to treat people the way they deserve to be treated, no matter how they treated you. When someone offends us, we often seek retaliation. But we're told here to do to others as we would like them to do to us. So the overarching principle to guide how we love our enemies is to do to others as we want them to do to us. But I think often we have this, this principle kind of reversed, and we think that it's just a matter of not doing negative things to people. Um, and, uh, and I think about with, with our own kids, often you know, Hudson and Lily will argue about something, or um, one of them will stick out their foot as the other one's walking by to try to trip them. And, and my question a lot of times is, you know, why did you do that? Did, would you want them to do that to you? And I think a lot of times we think negatively. We think, well, don't be mean to somebody because you don't want them to be mean to you. But this text goes farther than that. It's, it's the positive side of if you want good things, if you want people to speak kindly to you, if you want people to give you good gifts, you are to do that to other people, to be positive, to take the positive approach to this. It's far easier to not do to others what we would not want them to be done to us. But Jesus is teaching us to be proactive, to do to others what you want them to do to you. If everyone only did to others what they would have done to themselves, ultimately that would change our entire existence as human beings. Loving our enemies is at the very heart of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. So as we consider Jesus' words here, we have to understand that it, what they don't mean. It doesn't mean as a society that we let criminals run free and just do violence on any citizen. It doesn't mean we shouldn't call the police when we're robbed. It doesn't mean that we stand idly by when someone is assaulted or abused. Jesus isn't saying that if, if someone is going through your neighborhood stealing from cars, that you should just leave your car unlocked and say, here, take whatever you want. Jesus' words aren't about crime or pacifism in war. They're about loving our enemies in a radical way. The Bible speaks of normal protection, of self-defense. And so some people will apply this politically instead of personally. But as we study all of Scripture, especially the Old Testament law, it says that if someone defends himself, he is justified, that we have full rights to defend ourselves. Romans 13 talks about the executor of wrath, and so it's not wrong to protect ourselves against attack. So Jesus is not saying here that, it, that, that defense is wrong. But what he's trying to, come to, to get across to us is that we are to do it in the right way. To primarily defend and to protect other people. To protect the weak, to protect the vulnerable, to, to protect our family, our, our wives, our kids, and even other people in the church. Revenge is not the proper attitude. The attitude don't mess with me, and if you do, I'll show you to, do, to never to do that again. That's the world. That's not the attitude that we should have as believers. Instead, we ought to refuse to get offended. Our greatest need is not to turn the other cheek. Our greatest need is truly the Savior. And how are we showing the Savior to our enemies? Maybe you take a more active stance towards your enemies and you say bad things. Maybe you gossip about them. You spread lies about them. And you pray that God will punish them for their wicked. You know, that's how most of the world operates. That's how the unsaved would treat their enemies. But God's plan, God's way is much different. The command that we're to live by is quite different. We're to treat people the way that we want to be treated. Not the way they deserve to be treated, but the way that they should be treated. There is still the, the strong current here of, of radical love 
that we receive from our Heavenly Father. You know, if Jesus had treated us the way that we deserved, we'd all be doomed. But he's shown us grace. And now he expects his disciples to dispense that same grace and graciousness to the world all around us in his name. So what does this radical love look like? Well, the love that Jesus commands is a love that will return blessing for cursing, will respond with prayer, and will refuse to get offended. And finally, it's a love that will react with generosity. We ought to react with generosity. And he talks about giving here. In verse 29, he says to give your cloak. In verse 30, he says to give. In verse 34, to lend or to give without expectation. You know, I think one of the reasons why evangelism fails today is because people cannot see the love and grace of God in the lives of his people. Forget showing love to our enemies just just for a minute, because most of the time, we struggle loving our brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm convinced that that the church as as a whole would be far more effective completing the Great Commission if we truly had the proper kind of love for one another that God requires us to have. We cannot evangelize the lost until we truly love the saints. And we cannot love our enemies until we love other Christians. So it all begins with with love. Loving God, loving others, and loving our enemies. Jesus says in Luke 6.30, to give to everyone who asks you. And I think as parents, we all know well that it's very unloving to give our kids whatever they ask. Anything that they want, we just give to them. We ought to recognize that that is not true love, to just give whatever they want. If a drunkard or a drug addict asks you to give them money so they can go feed their addiction, we ought not do that. That's not loving to that person to feed their, their addictions. And instead, there's other things we can do. Maybe buy them a meal, help them out with other things uh, that, are, that are practical. But Jesus says if you want your coat, to give him your shirt. If someone comes and asks you for help, to help the person, Jesus says, be a servant. Live your life with the expectation of never gaining. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to accomplish here with this command of reacting with generosity, to live your life with the expectation of never gaining. When our enemy seeks to take what, what we own, we're still to love him. Because our possessions are not our own. Our possessions belong to God. Our love is to transcend even evil deeds. And that's Jesus' point here. So does Jesus mean that we're to give to every beggar, that we're to give to every con man that we meet? Of course not. He expects us to be good stewards of our money. The point is how we treat our enemies and the radical way that we love them. Love doesn't retaliate. Love seeks the enemy's good. So when your enemy takes your cloak, remember to still love him. You're to be praying for him. You're to be blessing him, to be seeking his good. So this is not just an act of command. It is a divine love. So we need to remember that God loved us when we were his enemy. Romans 5, 8 says that God showed his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In Romans 5, 10, two verses later, he says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled back to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. You see, we are acting like Jesus when we act in Christian love towards our enemies. Proverbs 25 tells us, if your enemy is hungry, to give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. You know, I think there's different views of of how people will interpret this verse. Many people think this has something to do with making our enemies angrier at us and somehow our our deeds towards them, our kind deeds towards them, will only make things worse. We read about this this heaping of of burning coals on their head and sometimes people think that this is just referring to judgment, that we want God's judgment on their lives and that's ultimately what we're praying for or what we're doing. But I don't think that's what it means. And when we study the historical context here, 
We look back at what happened in the Middle East, where rooms would have, would have been heated by a, a small, uh, uh, low grill or a furnace that was probably centered in the middle of, of, of their homes. And the, during the, the colder months especially, they would have a fire going constantly. And this is where the, the family meals would be cooked. This is where the family members would gather. This is what would have kept them warm. Every night they would bank the fire and they would hope that it would last all night long while they were sleeping. If they, if they awoke um, to a, a chilly house in the morning and they would recognize that the fire had gone out, what do they do? Well, they would go to their neighbor and they would ask their neighbor for some, some burning coals. If he had some coals to spare. So the borrower would carry the kettle of coals back home in the usual Middle Eastern manner on their heads. So Proverbs 25, I think, is teaching that when an enemy asks for coals to heat his house, to give him almost all that you have. Most people, when they had a good pile of coals, they would just give, just give one, you know, just enough to light their fire. And then they would keep the rest for themselves. Even if it was a good friend coming, that's all that they would do. But the writer of this proverb says, instead, to keep only one or two for yourself and to give the rest to your enemy. In this way, you will get great reward. So, if you put it in today's culture, imagine your, your enemy is having company over, uh, one of your neighbors. He's baking some bread, but he ran out of ingredients. And so, uh, uh, maybe it's Christmas Day or something, and all the stores are closed. And so he comes over and he just says, I just need one cup of flour and, and one egg. You know, most of us, if it was an enemy, we'd probably make up some story and say, sorry, whatever I have, I, I, I need for myself. Um, or uh, I only have a little bit left, and that's what I need for my own cooking. Well, the writer of Proverbs says, instead, to keep one egg for yourself and, and one cup of flour and to give him all the rest that you have. And this is a, a shocking mindset. This is a shocking approach to really anybody, a, anyone uh, much less our, our enemy. But this is what Jesus is teaching in Luke 6, to do good to your enemies. Not to bring more judgment on them, but simply to show love for them. So when Jesus went on and, and he said, what good is it if you love those who love you? Even sinners do that. What good is it if you only do good to those who do good to you? He said, you will be You, should, you need to follow this advice because he says you will, you'll be the sons of the Most High because who is God? He says there that he is kind to the unthankful and to the evil. And so because he is merciful, we ought to be merciful. You should be known as a person of mercy because you have been a recipient of God's mercy. You should mark that, that mercy should mark your behavior. Just as God has been kind to us, we should be kind to others. If there's a core meaning, I think, in, in all of these exhortations, it's mercy instead of vengeance. God is the avenging God. God promises to make unjust things just. God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, but vengeance is not yours. There's a story of a, of a man uh, who was seen one day going out in a boat on a river with a large dog, which he wished to get rid of. And he thought that he was going to get rid of this dog by drowning the dog in the river. And so this man succeeded in throwing the animal into the water, but the dog kept trying to get back into the boat. And so as the, as the man was attempting to beat the dog from the boat, what happened? Well, he fell overboard himself. And so there were witnesses around, and witnesses say that the man would have himself drowned if the dog had not grabbed him by his coat and dragged him to shore and rescued him. You know, when someone tries to do you harm, Jesus is saying, do good to them. Just as Paul writes in Romans 12, do not overcome evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. So this morning, there's four simple applications, four things that we should do, I think, with this text. Number one, Simply decide to do something good to someone who has done you harm, someone who has wronged you. So seek to do something proactive, actively. Number two, say something positive about someone who said something bad and to do what Jesus says here, to bless them. 
Put someone on your prayer list and pray for the person who has hurt you and pray that God will bless them according to his will and according to his plan. So pray for those people and actively plan to do that. Have that person on your prayer list and and to be praying for them. Number four, simply give a gift to someone who doesn't like you at all. Be kind, be generous, love your enemies. Jesus says to pray for them, do good to them and by God's grace, and that doing so could change them from being your enemy to being your friend. We're to overcome evil with good. You know, each of us have a lot that we can do in order to to think right and to act right as we apply this text to our lives this week. But our prayer should be that the Holy Spirit would do a work in us and that God would do a change in our hearts, that we would have this radical love that Jesus requires us to have as his followers. Let me ask you to, to please stand with me. We'll have a, a, just a time of invitation, a time for you to ask God to reveal what he needs revealed in your life and that you would have the love that Jesus requires us to, to have, that we would truly love not just our brothers and sisters in Christ, but that we would even have this radical love for our enemies. So if you'd like to, to talk with God there in your seat, do so. You're welcome to pray at the front. But just have a, a time of, of prayer as Dan plays the piano and then we'll close the service. Thank you.